Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show. Discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Hosted by Desiree Duffy. It is time for us to get booky with it. Welcome! It is time for the Books That Make You Show, and I'm your host, Desiree Duffy. And today, we're talking about books that make you enthralled by a true family saga. Uh Uh-huh. We all have families with a, a dash of drama, don't we? Perhaps there are some secrets hidden in the branches of our family trees, or tantalizing stories that we don't dare discuss in certain circles. And then, unfortunately, some of us have horrors of abuse and trauma that burden us. Now, within those pages, though, within these types of books, we can also find stories of hope and the power of love and the ways that we can overcome stress and trauma. Elizabeth Garden, she wrote such a book. It's called Tree of Lives and it spans the 20th century, and it follows the main character, her name is Ruth, demonstrating how feisty and independent women paved the way in the fight for social equality as the decades unraveled. It's ambitious, it is tender, and at the heart of this novel is the story of one woman who made her own way with wit and grit and luck and a wide open heart. Elizabeth spent her wonder years in Connecticut's Fairfield County. She's a self-proclaimed frustrated horse enthusiast, and she channeled her appreciation of their magnificence into the paintings and designs that she's created over the years. And despite struggling as a single mom, she built a successful career as an award-winning art director. She enjoys studying human and spiritual potential. Tree of Lives is a true story. It is her first book, and Elizabeth, hello. Welcome to the show. Hello, and thank you very much. I'm excited to have you here because when we hear about books that have these epic family sagas, I think we all immediately can relate to it because, let's face it, we all have families of some sort, and a lot of us have, you know, skeletons hidden in our closets. That's where the saying comes from, right? So tell us about your book and just give us the lay of the land if you could the setting and the inspiration behind it the inspiration happened because i uh was diagnosed with cancer and i felt urgency to get my story correct because there was sort of some incorrect information floating within my family about about me and I, I, I needed to express that in order to kind of set the record straight in case I wasn't going to be around to do that in person. Um, but it, I came from a family that I thought was normal when I was growing up. But uh, then I realized comparing it with other people's families that it really was not normal at all. Um, and I was victimized um, and carried a burden of, of being abused for for decades and um, kept kind of attracting the same sort of people in my life, which uh, I, I really questioned. I, I didn't understand what was going on. I was invisibly creating the same situation over and over in a way. But then uh, when I was in my 50s, I discovered what I consider to be the nexus of uh, what happened because primarily – Um, My father was uh, pretty much of a tyrant, and um, I'm pretty sure he had PTSD. It was undiagnosed, but um, he was was kind of a monster, and I discovered something terrible happened when he was a kid. It gave me perspective, excuse me, and I wanted to, I wanted to talk about this story and, and, through writing the story, actually, um, I could see how that affected me and how I could change my story. 
just writing it down, getting it out had to be very therapeutic for you. Yeah, very much so. Um, I started it in bits and pieces. I would just write stuff and then put it away. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of these were ended up being chapters in the story that I was able to kind of string together. Um, but they all made so much sense once I discovered this terrible story, this su- subplot, I guess you could say. And um, I realized that that everything affects everything. And uh, what happens before, even if we don't know about it, affects us even today. So um, I really felt bad about this branch of my family that was killed. They were all killed. And I and then my father, this is my father's uncle and his children and his and his wife. And then it was as and then he was kind of forbidden to ever talk about it. So these people, they were they were not only killed, but they never existed in the family. And I felt that needed to be corrected. And that seems to happen a lot with families, too. Uh, it, it seems like we don't talk about certain things. We don't bring that up. And that seems to be something that it reoccurs in a lot of families. And I know you won't, you don't want to give away too much of the book and the plot, but you're really, you know, kind of digging into some of these secrets and the, the murders and the killings and stuff. Can, can you give us just a little bit more so we can put it into perspective? Well, unfortunately, my father's uncle uh, was uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia and committed to uh, an insane asylum. But this was like in 1930. And, the, you know, the state of the art of mental health care was really, you know, very uh basic and they were it was actually kind of experimental they would inject people with all sorts of stuff to kind of try to put them in a coma or introduce diabetic shock and um they really didn't know what they were doing in those days it was even before lobotomies i mean it was really early days and so he and he was um from my research uh my great uncle was actually known as a very nice guy but he just went off the deep end um, and escaped and um, ended up killing his family. But the way he did it was absolutely horrible and very public. So it was not only a huge tragedy and a shock, but it was probably deeply embarrassing, too. To, it was probably mortifying to my father, and this was his only extended family. So it was probably, a, you know, he was about 10 at the time. So it was, a, you know, he knew these guys. They they were his only cousins. Um, I just can't imagine what he went through. And it was in all the newspapers. It was all around the country. It was a giant story until it got, you know, forgotten. And uh, I don't, I think that that just kept him in a state of rage that, that, he tried to keep a lid on it, but he just, he just, you know, couldn't assimilate all that and, and keep it within. It was too much. Mm-hmm. And that sounds like that was the catalyst and that led to other things down the road. And you had mentioned earlier that telling your story, setting the record straight, so to say, is a way for you to, you know, leave this behind. And I know you went through cancer and you know my, I'm sorry to hear that but you you are here with us right here and now so that's a positive so can you talk just a little bit did you get pushback in writing this are there members of your family who wish that you would have kept silent and how did it feel to finally just speak your truth some people don't want to read this story and I actually feel like I need to uh, protect my family my, you know, immediate family. So, um, they, so I, you know, I used a pen name and I changed everyone's name in the story. I don't, I don't have, uh, I don't have to shame people because it's not just, um, this thing with my father, my brothers were abusive. Um, my sisters, everybody was kind of terrible and I, I don't really care to embarrass them. Um, but at the same time, I, 
find some satisfaction out of making them an archetype because because everybody in the story is kind of an archetype and people learn when people are exposed to toxic toxicity um narcissistic you know uh, environment terrible abuse um sometimes they become abusers sometimes they become narcissists too they learn how to do it they think that's normal um luckily for me i don't think you know i i i was just the scapegoat in the family that was my role so um so in a way i i escaped and i don't because especially after having cancer and having <clears throat> excuse me chemo and lots and lots of toxic toxicity dumped into my system i don't want any more so i don't need i don't feel the need to uh, expose myself to toxic people so that was that was what i did i just kind of left um those people behind and wrote my story to get it out of my system i don't need to don't really care to you know shame them i just you know left it as is so and sometimes too in the bad things that happen to us obviously there's good that comes out of it because you can tell this story as a cautionary tale to others you can help others who might be going through something similar so it, it, you're right a lot of times really bad things happen to us and that perpetuates but by telling the story you are hopefully ending that for other people who are reading it and that's the good thing that can come out of something that's really traumatic and devastating. It's true and it's so gratifying to know that people do feel I mean therapists use this book for their patients who the adult patients who were abused as children um and they 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 see their patients go through a transformation um but just by reading this book I mean, it's really, it, and that's unexpected. I didn't really write it as because I'm, you know, um, trying to help everybody. But in in the end, it it does help people. So um, I I'm just amazed myself that that of that beautiful um, sideline of of this book. I, I love that. Mm -hmm. And how does art play into the book? I know you're an artist. Does art help in the healing process as well? Absolutely. Art is, I, I think, was what kept me sane. I, because, you know, I, I didn't want to expose myself to, I, I tried to minimize my exposure as a kid growing up. I was always in my room and I was always drawing. And I had kind of created my own little world. And that was where the, the horse thing came in because I loved horses, but I wasn't allowed to ride them or be near them. And so I drew them and I kind of got good at drawing them. And I got positive uh, feedback from school uh, for, for my art. And um, to me, art is a, is like a channel. It's like a secret channel and art, you know, they use art and therapy all the time to, it, it, it goes beyond words and it's, it's a beautiful uh, way to, get information because you have to kind of visualize something you want to draw or even if you're not even trying to draw something realistically you're just drawing with color or shapes it's still um a, such great it's it i can't explain it really but it's a it's a wonderful calming way and it goes to a to me another dimension it's a, it's a way to um to get information that you can then put on a piece of paper and there it, it, it's going to last longer than you there. You've created something it's beyond you and it's hopefully a thing of beauty. Can we discuss the theme of women's independence that you have in the book as well? Because that seems to be a very strong idea that you have. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, the story follows Ruth, which is pretty much my story. And I had to work and um, I didn't really I didn't get to finish college. I had to start working right away. And this was in the 70s. Um, and I had children and I had I mean, I, I didn't really intend to have my first uh, baby, but I, I did. And um, I, I had to support my family. Um, so I always worked and I was very lucky and I got jobs. Uh, my original jobs were, well, my very first job was as a school bus driver. 
<laughs> but um, that was a bit of a fiasco. And I ended up um, getting a job at a newspaper and um, convincing the publisher that, you know, I showed him some of my artwork and he uh, he gave me an opportunity to set up an art department in a newspaper. And I learned so much just by working, but I, I didn't really get paid very well, but I just loved um, being where the action is and being able to, to, to create. And it was always, it was a very fast turnaround because it was news, you know, so you had to mm-hmm. be very fast. Um, and I just worked my way up, but it was, it was still early days for, for women in journalism. Um, and I, I was, it was really one of my saving graces was that I had a good career and, and it helped me develop my identity and confidence. So Ruth is essentially you, and this is her story. What are some of the um, other um, experiences that she had? I mean, I know here it says that, you know, she, she was very feisty and she was independent and she paved the way in the fight for social equality. How did she pave the way for social equality? Ruth did her own path. Um, because she didn't have a path that was shown to her. And so she, um, she ended up, her, the father of her children was from India. And this was before there were a lot of people from India that were, you know, I mean, the, people were in very segregated groups, like, in, you know, she grew up in Connecticut. Um, she met him in Boston, raised her children herself. And, it, you know, it's a, it's luckily it's a different world now. I mean, it, this, this, this country does need some help. I mean, really, we have a lot of unresolved things. There's lots of pockets of, you know, horrible um, racial disparity. But um, to be a single mother in earlier days than now, uh, it's 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 better. It's not great, but it's it's getting better. Back then, children a lot of times that were born of parents from two different cultures or two different races, however you want to define it, they then felt themselves not able to fit in on either side. There was discrimination both ways. So is that something, too, that your children had to, to deal with? Luckily, I lived in places that it wasn't, su- it wasn't such a, a giant issue. Um, uh, after Boston, we moved to Miami. Part of the research of this book was into my family, and my I did a lot of research into into my ancestors, and they they were the oppressors. I have relatives that went to the royalty in France, and um, also um, the Vikings, and you know these are they were people. They they all were they were the ones. Some of these people in, in the very first page of the book is my family tree goes all the way back to uh, FamilySearch.org, which is the Mormon site, where they really do a really good job of documenting people. And I found a relative, the relative who came to America in the 1600s, and there was a notation on her on her chart that said, "You can follow this person to the year eight. So I did, and I followed it, and I made a graphic that goes all the way back to. And then I went to the um, to the Bible because the, the you, from that from the Royal Genealogical Society to go back to you know through the Bible. Then I mean, but the thing that I thought found very interesting was that there's not that many generations. When you put it all on paper, there's like 170 generations. That's that's not that many. That of uh, uh, going back through you know 5,000 years ago, and so in my book. I imagined all those people um, together, and and I discuss uh, what goes on on the other side. I'm very interested in that. What what is it like? We're here on Earth right now, but this thing that happened to, to my father's family it affected me, and I wasn't even alive yet. If you really do believe that there is life that continues, that life you know, is a, has continuity and that even though you're dead, you still exist. Well, well, what happens with him? If he went crazy because of his brain was, you know, defective. Um, so what he doesn't have a brain anymore. He's dead, but he has a soul. 
and these things happened and they affected in people into the future so that's the perspective that i put in this story is a lot of it takes place on the other side and what when you're dead, my theory is that you can't do anything. You don't have a body. You can't make anything happen. But you you observe. And so um, I basically set it up that there that all these people are observing what karma they created and and Earth what happens here and now. It's like like a like a like a stage show. Just like we love watching television. Well, maybe they are too. Maybe they're very interested in what goes on on Earth. And uh, it sounds a little wacky, but uh, I think it's a really interesting thing to think about what it, what what we're doing here and how what we're going to do today. Uh, how's that going to affect twenty years from now, forty years from now, hundred years from now? Right, and that's a really interesting perspective that you bring up because on the one hand. Um, if we do have an immortal soul and that soul is residing in a body, whether there's a mental illness, schizophrenia, something isn't right within the body, is the soul therefore responsible for that? And if indeed they're perpetuating things that happen and extend beyond their life because they influence other lives, obviously, what are the consequences of that? That's a really intriguing perspective that you have. Yeah, I, I love thinking about things like this. Feeling, I, I studied a lot of, you know, the other side. Part of Ruth's story and my story is I worked as a psychic in a tea room. And I learned, and it was very much the same kind of wavelength as art, as when I'm trying to think of, okay, I've got to do a graphic for, you know, some news story, and I got to draw something. In a way, it was it was sort of the same, ep- like, exercise if I was going to read somebody's tea leaves. It's like I see these pictures in my mind, and I tell the person about it. Instead of drawing it, I'm just telling them. It turned out that I was pretty accurate. So um, I, I have a very strong belief in the other side and, and that that we c- continue to exist. And I also think that we, if we have some karmic reasons to come back, we do. We make deals with each other and we, um, you know, I, I posit in this story that uh, I was one of those kids that uh, got killed. And that I needed to come back and write the story. Well, and that's the the beauty of being able to tell a story like this. So it, it's it's based on things that really happen. You have the facts there, and in taking a little bit of creative license, you can imagine. Well, maybe maybe this happened or could have happened, and whether it's true or not, or there's elements of it that are true, or there's as you know, bits of inspiration that are true. What matters at the end is that you have this story and you're putting it out there and it's something that other people can experience too. And they can take it and use it in ways that help enrich them. So tell me a little bit about who you think this book is for. Who's the target audience? Who should be buying your book? Well, I, I think it's a good broad range of people, um, and it doesn't have to be just women. Um, I, I know lots of men who really love this story. Um, anybody who suffered any kind of abuse or bullying or um, discrimination, um, people looking for a little bit more because I, I think that they feel enriched by uh, opening up a perspective of thinking about you know, their their families, their place, their, and not just their present families, but who came before, to reach back in their minds to their uncles and great-grandfathers and their ancestors and, and having empathy for uh, what people went through, trying to get perspective. If you're exposed to people who are terrible, understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, understanding that there's usually a reason why people act out or choose to be abusive or maybe they don't choose it. They can't help it. It's a reflex. I don't know. But, um, 
a good range of people and also baby boomers also because it it follows my timeline and a lot of people are in this bracket i just turned 65 although it is kind of universal you don't have to be an older person to to enjoy this story excellent and it sounds like it would make a great gift during the holidays for a number of people can you tell us what are you working on now or what's the next thing is there something artistic are you doing some more writing i'm doing a little bit of writing i i have a project i'm working on which is um I love finding hints and clues in nature. Mm. So I did a series of photographs and I kept finding um, these faces and, you know, it just sounds a little silly, but I think it'll turn out really well of finding the the spirit that's in a tree or a rock or, you know, whatever by painting over the photograph. So that's my, my next uh, series is going to be about to do more artwork while also trying to promote my book. I love it. I love it. And where can people find you online, your website, your social media? Where is the book available? The book is on Amazon, and it's Tree of Lives by Elizabeth Garden. Um, and it's treeoflives.net, which is a got, it's got links to buy the book. And there are 21 reviews that are 20 of them are five stars as one four star. I did an audio book, and um, that's on Audible. And did you have social media as well where people can find you? Yeah, I have a, I have Twitter. It's uh, My Rocky Path, at, uh, and I do have a uh, Elizabeth Garden and Tree of Lives has a Facebook page. Fantastic. Elizabeth, thank you so much. This has been a really inspiring conversation, and your book sounds like not only was it a, a great way for you to tell your story, but it's something that others are going to enjoy reading, too, because it's going to help them possibly unravel their own stories. I love that. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. You bet. Once again, you have been listening to Books That Make You, and my name is Desiree Duffy. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and you can find out more about us. We're on BooksThatMakeYou.com, and you can also find us. We're on Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, all of my bookish buddies, please enjoy every single book that makes you exactly who you are. The executive producer for Books That Make You is Desiree Duffy, produced and sound mastered by Phil Jean Grande, engineering by Dave Nabox, social media and promotion by Bree Sweeter. For more, visit booksthatmakeyou.com.